Um, if you've been with us, you kind of know we're kind of working through Romans. Um, if you haven't been with us, let me kind of bring you up to speed. So we're working through Romans. Romans is a letter that was written to Roman Christians by a guy by the name of Paul. Awesome. And Paul used to be named Saul. That's right. So remember back in Acts, um, Acts chapter 8, um, there's this young kind of, you know, charismatic, like, go get him, bull by the horns, star Pharisee, who wanted to get rid of followers of Jesus. And he was kind of responsible for orchestrating Stephen getting stoned, who was the first martyr. That was Saul. He then was headed on the road to Damascus to get rid of more followers of Jesus. And he had an experience with Jesus. We often think in our kind of Americanized Western culture that you think your way into being a follower of Jesus. That when you've got enough knowledge, then that will produce the experience. And oftentimes in the scriptures, that's not what happens at all. Normally the experience precedes the explanation. And so Paul has an experience with Jesus. It changes his life. He then takes the way in which God has made him, all of his fervor, his passion, his commitment, like his desire, and he leverages it out for the rest of his life in planting churches and coaching churches all over Asia Minor. And much of the New Testament that we have is this guy, Paul, writing letters to churches. So he didn't have Snapchat, he didn't have Facebook, he didn't have text messaging, email, phone, pager, depending on how old you are in the room today. He didn't have any of that, right? What he had was he had letters to pen to paper. Sometimes folks would write these letters for him, and he would send letters to these churches to help them to continue to run after the things that God was putting on their hearts. Now, Romans, although it's the first letter we read in the Bible um, from Paul, I think it's his last one that he, he wrote. It's his most extensive letter. It's the longest letter. That's why they go from longest to shortest. In many ways, you get like this old, mature Paul looking back at his life to say to these Roman Christians, this is what is most important. As I reflect upon everything that I've been through, this is the big picture of everything that I would leave with you. This is a man who's been beaten a number of times for his faith. He's been shipwrecked. He's been thrown in jail. He's been run out of cities. He's experienced it. And now he's saying in light of all of that, these are the things that I've learned. These are the things that I would leave with you. And so we've been traveling through that, looking at those. Um, today, we're going to spend some time in Romans chapter 8. All right, when Romans chapter 8. And in many ways, I think what's important when we read Romans is we want to think about, you ever been around, I have, I've had the privilege of being around a number of people kind of at the end of their life, not like they were getting ready to die on their deathbed, just like older folks. And one of the things that's interesting is the longer you live, um, the longer you live, it seems the more wisdom you have and the more clarity you have. Now, I know it's not always the case, but in most situations, it's the more wisdom you have, the more clarity you have about life as you look back at life, as opposed to um, someone like my daughter Cammie, who is 12 um, and thinks she's a full-fledged adult when she's just beginning to become a teenager, and everything looking forward, looking ahead in her life, she thinks she's got the whole world figured out. And a lot of it sounds like confusion and absurdity, all right? That's called being a teenager, right? And I'm act actively killing our youth ministry today as I talk about this. So you're welcome, Mike and Beth. Um, no, but honestly, like that's kind of a piece of it. And so Paul, here Paul is as a wise man with clarity, looking back and saying, these are the things that I, I want to leave with you, you Roman Christians, things that he wants to leave um, with us. Romans 8 is one of these sacred pieces of scripture. If I read it and you feel like, I have no idea what you just said, that's all right. Most everybody will feel the same way. Paul is so intellectually like, he's just up there. He's got it. And he's able to put things together that you can just dive deep into this thing forever. And these verses are just like that, okay? Here we go. Romans 8, uh, verse 1. We're going to read the first 12 verses. 
There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. It's interesting. Most people think if you become a follower of Jesus, it actually enslaves you, right? That's something that confines you. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That's just a fancy way for saying that on the cross, God looked at sin through Jesus Christ, made war with it, and he won. That's just a fancy way to say that, all right? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. In other words, Paul just says this, people who live in the flesh in the world, their frame of reference is, is the world. Those who are living in the Spirit, a Spirit-filled life is just saying they're living by God's frame of reference within the world. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It's working against God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. When I'm living in my own frame of reference, I can't please God. I'm pleasing myself. You, right, you Roman Christians, us, you, however, are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit, you are not in the world. You are, are in the world, but not of the world. You're in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's a mouthful, huh? Right? It's a mouthful. All right. A couple of things I just want to point out to you today. The overarching thing is this. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Many of us, if we've had any sort of experience with the church growing up, if you've been anywhere close to the southeast, there's probably been a lot of condemnation in Jesus. Right? Um, yeah. So one thing you just need to know, overarching, I'm not going to chase that rabbit, is just there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. That's what's overarching everything this morning. In other words, where grace is found, that's where God is found. Where hope is found, that's where God is found. All right? God is not found in judgment. God is not found in despair. God is not found, excuse me, in hopelessness. Okay? Verses 7, 8, and 9. Well, I think what Paul's getting at in those three verses is Paul's talking about their frame of reference has to change. If my frame of reference is my flesh, meaning my frame of reference is my life, if my frame of reference is my life, I'm projecting that frame of reference onto everything else. And if I'm projecting my frame of reference onto everything else, there's no way that I can live a life representing God and representing God's way. He's saying to the Romans, if you're projecting your frame, if your frame of reference is your life, if you're in the center of the world and you're projecting everything from your life experiences onto the way in which you see reality, you will not be able to represent God and God's way. In fact, you'll represent death. All right? You'll represent what I defeated. Now, it's also interesting that Paul's like, but at the same time, at the same time, if you're living that kind of life, You'll be a person that's hostile to God. You won't please God. And that doesn't mean condemnation, right? Sometimes we read words like it's not going to be pleasing to God as condemnation. In the same way that my little 12-year-old, I'm not sure if it's still Cammie or if a demon's living in there or if like she's a preteen, an alien, like took her body and I'll get her back when she's 18. I have no idea, right? Right? I don't know that. But at the same time, when she's hostile towards me, right, when she does things that doesn't please me, I don't like pull out her birth certificate and like, let me white out Pullins. You know, what's a different last name you'd like to have? 
And if you're good tomorrow, I'll put pullings back in there. No, it doesn't. There's no condemnation in Jesus. Right? There are times where you're going to do things, I'm going to do things that may not be pleasing to the Father. Things that may be hostile to God's way of life. But it doesn't mean that he's removing us from the family because there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But we're called, we're called, I think Paul's calling the Roman church to do and calling us to. He's saying this, you need to grow up. You, you need to live into maturity. You need to move from someone who looks around at my reality and sees confusion and absurdity because you're using your own frame of reference to be projected on everything else to be someone that moves into maturity where God's frame of reference is what's informing everything that you look at. That it's God's reference point that you're seeing the world through so that you have clarity and wisdom you need to grow into maturity. Living in the Spirit, living a Spirit-filled life is a life where God's reality is the frame of reference. Living a flesh-filled life is where your reality is the frame of reference. Now, one of the things that I've just observed kind of being in this gig for a little while is that often what we will do is we will project our frame of reference, our own experience and reality onto God. But a lot of times we'll project our experience and our reality onto God instead of allowing God to project His reality onto us. You with me? Lots of times we'll assume that we're the ones that went to heaven. Now, we went to God's reality and said, hey, we made it, we're here, and we project all that on Him. Instead of resting in the truth that we didn't go to Him, He came to us in Jesus. Right? You tracking? He came to our reality. We didn't go to His. We didn't invade His space. He invaded our space. But often, we'll project our own experience, our reality, onto God. In other words, we'll pretend the Lord's Prayer says, on heaven as it is in earth, instead of on earth as it is in heaven. We'll live that way without even, without even knowing it. God's reality and truth never makes sense when we assume that our experience that our reality here in this world is the frame of reference. Let me say that again. God's reality and truth, namely that God has come to us in Jesus Christ and through Jesus' life and death and resurrection, he has forgiven us, restored us back into life. He has made things new in us. We are a new creation, and in the end, God will make all things new. That reality, that truth will never make sense when we're living a life where we assume our own experience is the reference point of how we view the world. Oftentimes, we project our own brokenness onto God. And when I project my own brokenness onto God, it never leads to a life of truth and peace and love. When I project my own brokenness onto God, I'm saying my brokenness is more powerful than God is. I'm projecting it on to Him. I think as I just observe and talk to people, so often we really allow our brokenness to define us more than we allow God's truth to define us. And many of us, Honestly, we just got daddy issues. It's amazing to me. If our dads were absent growing up, we'll project that on the father and we'll think God is absent. If, if our growing up, if we were always valued based upon what we did instead of who we are, We'll often project that onto the Father. That we only have value in God's family based on what we do instead of who He tells us that we are. So 
those are just a couple of examples. But you'd be surprised if you really just took a hard look in the mirror. I've had to do this in my own life, right? In my family, like, image was important. How other people around you perceived you was like a huge deal for my family. Huge deal. Right? Kind of clothes we wore, what people would say about you, how you sat, like all this kind of stuff. It's amazing how much that caused me to project that onto God growing up. Where I thought image mattered. How I looked mattered. And then I would project, I got married, and so I had this idea that if my wife, like if she didn't act this way and do this and be this and do this and do this, that everybody else is going to look at me and I'm like, man, you got a problem. And so I spent the first part of my marriage just projecting so much onto my wife. There's a book Paul Tripp wrote called What Did You Expect? It was about marriage. Like when you get married, like what did you expect? And we so often want to make our spouse into who we think they ought to be instead of who they are. Right? And so often we do that with the Father. We do that with God within our lives. I think we just have to recognize that. What I want you to hear in the midst of this is that there is no condemnation in Jesus, no matter where you are. You might be at a place in your faith walk right now where you are like that preteen, right? You are at that place where you've moved from the little Sunday school, like, oh, I do love Jesus, I believe in him, into a place where now you're wrestling out and wondering to yourself, like, where does all this fit? And now you've got so much knowledge within your mind, you're trying to figure out, like, at what point, where does this fit? How does it all work together? Without even knowing it, you begin to allow your life to be the frame of reference for your relationship with Jesus. What you need to know, if that's you this morning, there's no condemnation in Jesus. There's no condemnation. Like, he's not removing your name from the birth certificate. That's not happening. But at the same time, what you need to know is that God has come to you in Jesus. You haven't come to God. That God loves you. He loves you. He desires for you to mature, not to just remain a Christian teenager forever, but to move to clarity and to move to wisdom. It's his heart for you. So does God enjoy when I project my reality onto him? No, he doesn't like when I'm hostile like that. But it doesn't mean he wants to get rid of me. He's not looking for a reason to get rid of me. I'm not looking for a reason to get rid of Cammie. Like, I love her, right? She's my girl. Like, I love her. It's hard for me to even express the amount. I, I love the guts out of that little girl, right? And you guys have heard me say it before. Like, Jesus loves you. Like, I love Cammie, just more of it. I mean, just think about the one place where you felt most secure and certain in your life. Maybe it's that time sitting on your mom or dad's lap. Maybe it's the time of holding your husband or your wife. Maybe it's the time, the first time you looked at your baby, boy or girl. Maybe it was the time when you were standing across from your husband and wife saying, I do. Just whatever that time is in your life where you felt most secure, most loved, most that everything was right in the world. God loves you just like that moment, just more of it. That's insane, isn't it? And heaven is just like that moment, but it's like that all the time. Never ending, never stopping. And that father wants the same thing for you and, and that I want for my daughter, just more of it. He wants you to grow, to experience life the way that he came to give it to you. And that can only happen if his reality is the frame of reference for your life. It's a maturity thing for us. I think what Paul saying to the Roman church, he'd say to us today, is God is going to be patient with you. He can handle your questions. He can handle your doubt. He can handle you projecting your reality onto him. He can get it. He can handle your absurdity. He can handle your confusion because he's a good and faithful dad. And even if he's not pleased with you where you are in your walk, right? If he's not pleased with the fact that you're projecting your frame of reference onto him, it doesn't mean that he's going to condemn you. He just desires for you to grow. But the only way that you grow to maturity, 
The only way that I begin to grow from an adolescent into an adult in the faith is if I press into God's frame of reference and not my own. Oftentimes, oftentimes, we will allow our reality of life to be a greater voice in our life than God's reality, which is the Bible. And so it's just been my experience, the more that I press into God's story, right, the more I learn his story, the more I allow his frame of reference to be my frame of reference. If I'm not engaged in his story, if I don't know his story, if I'm not searching it out, the default is, is my life will be the story that I choose to look through to project onto him. So it doesn't just come from osmosis, right? Like Cammie's just not going to move from a confused, absurd teenager into a mature adult, unless she does what? Unless she figures some stuff out. The same is true within our lives, within our walk of faith. We've got to get into his story. We've got to press into God's frame of reference, not our own. A spirit-filled life is a life where God's frame of reference is your frame of reference. A spirit-filled life is where God's reality is your reflective lens for how you see the world. That's what a spirit-filled life is, where you look at your job, your marriage, your kids, your finances through the lens of God's reality, not your own experience, right? That his reality um, defines you. And what's his frame of reference? What is that reality? Well, it is the truth that God has come to you in Jesus. And that as God has come to you in Jesus, God in the flesh, he has come not to condemn you, but he's come to invite you into a family. He's come to invite you to live in God's reality, a spirit-filled life. For me, Jesus is what makes everything else different from other things like religion. All right? This is my personal opinion. I'm sure I'm probably wrong, so take it for what it's worth. I just think religion comes from us projecting our frame of reference onto trying to explain God. That's all I think. All right? At the end of the day, what's different is that in Jesus, God has come to our reality. We're not trying to get to his He's come to ours. At the end of the day, we all have to ask the question, do I believe that Jesus is God? Do I believe he's God? And if I believe he's God, that means God's come to my reality. And that changes everything. Everything. It's a question that all of us have to answer within our lives. Is it, did God come to us in Jesus? And if I believe that to be true, it changes everything for me in my life. Life. Living a spirit filled life is a life where God's reality is our frame of reference, that God's reality becomes the lens for all of our lives. My marriage, my parenting, my finances, my job, my purpose, all of it, all of it. And here's the encouragement, right? Here's the encouragement. So I walk upstairs. I look at Cammie's room, or I look now, she like does the dishes, or and as you get older in our house, you get more responsibility, or like how she's, you know, picking out her clothes, or folding her clothes, or doing the laundry, all the stuff that she has to do. I, I don't look at all of it and just condemn her all the time. I'm happy she's doing it. Now, do I want like the dishes to be like halfway unloaded? or the clothes to be halfway folded forever? No, I expect her to get better at it. All right? I expect her to get better at it. Here's just a simple phrase that we just hang on to around here. Anything worth doing is worth doing poorly until you get better at it. It's not you to do it poorly forever, just until you get better at it. There's no condemnation in Jesus. None. None. It's just an invitation to live a spirit-filled life where God's reality is your frame of reference, not your own. And so just know you got, a, you got an invitation to give it a go. And anything worth doing, and believe me, it's worth doing, is worth doing poorly till you get better at it. And here's what will happen. Here's what will happen. Eventually, eventually, if you'll fight for that in your life, eventually 
you'll be at a place, you may already be at a place, where you'll have more wisdom and clarity to give than what you need to receive. Absurdity and confusion will change the wisdom and clarity. And you'll have much more to give than what to receive. I think what's Paul, that's what Paul's trying to get the Romans to run after. I think, honestly, that's what we should run after in life. I think it's worth it. I found it to be worth it in my own life. Good? All right. Let's just take a moment. Would love for you just to think, what's the one thing that's grabbing your attention this morning?